you already know that there are three states of matter, solids, liquids, and gases. We've looked at some of the problems that we solve using liquids, at least as far as it has to do with solutions, but we haven't yet looked at gases. In this unit, we'll also be looking at solids, but today we're going to be looking at gas laws, the super simplified gas laws we use in high school chemistry. All right, we're going to start learning about gas laws. We're beginning unit seven, or at least the way I've got the instruction currently configured is unit seven. But before we actually get into the gas laws, we need to talk about some underlying theory. I mean, you could probably go into the gas laws first and then discuss the underlying theory later, but I like to discuss some of the theory up front. And what we're talking about here are intermolecular forces. Now, when we use the term intermolecular forces, um, what we usually mean by that is the forces between molecules. And that's true when it comes to gases. Because all gases in, you know, reasonable ranges of temperature and pressure, the kind of things we have on the planet Earth, all gases are formed by molecules. Now that might seem a little bit confusing if you're thinking about noble gases, because noble gas molecules are single atoms. But that's true, they are single atoms. Uh, they don't bond with anything, but they're discrete, separate units. And that is one way to think about what a molecule is. It's a discrete, separate unit. But there are some attractions between all molecules. Some large attractions and some small attractions. Okay, so when we're talking about these molecules, they are one of the structural particles of matter. Um, these are the building blocks of the physical states of matter we talk about. These are not just atoms. Building blocks, these structural particles, can be atoms, but they can also be ions, both monoatomic ions and polyatomic ions. They can be molecules, and they can be polar or nonpolar. And we've talked about that in a previous unit, how to figure out when uh, a molecule is polar or not. You have to, in this class, we learn to figure out whether they're polar or not by going through and building the structure, starting with electron dot formulas and sharing arrangements and uh, figuring out the Lewis dot formula and then figuring out the shape of the actual molecule, beginning with electron dot formulas. And after electron dot formulas, well, um, I'm sorry, um, electron pair shapes, and then after figuring out the electron pair shape for that molecule, we'll figure out a modified electron pair shape and then a molecular shape. And sometimes there is no modified electron pair shape in our system. But structural particles can be atoms, ions, or molecules. Um, we will be talking about the structural particles in a metal in this unit. Uh, metal structural particles, um, we use the term atom to refer to the structural particle of a metal, but at least the way that I think about things, the structural particle of a metal is somewhere between being an atom and an ion. It's not really an ion, and it's not really a, an atom, because its behavior is somewhere in between the two. So it's really something entirely new. All right, states of matter, and I'm going to list these in terms of highly organized to least organized, okay? And this is important. When you look at the uh, four fundamental laws of the universe in uh, physics theory, uh, one of those um, laws is the universe is tending toward um, entropy. Well, entropy is disorder. And so the order of matter, the, the way that it's organized and structured is important. It has a lot to do with its behavior. And so uh, when we're starting to think about these different physical states of matter here, we want to think about uh, how organized they are. So the first one would be solids. And these have structural particles. These atoms or ions or molecules that are fixed in place 
but they still wiggle around. They still twist, okay? You can think about it like a classroom full of students sitting in desks. Well, you aren't sitting completely still, okay? You're writing notes or your head's going up and down as you listen and look at the projector up here. Um, you're twisting in your chair, you know, you're crossing and uncrossing your feet, propping your feet on the next desk in front of you, and so forth. You're moving around a little bit. Well, atoms or molecules in solids are like this, or ions are like this. They're not sitting still. They're sitting still relative to each other, like you are sitting still in a desk, but you're not completely still. Okay? Now, liquids, on the other hand, these structural particles, the atoms, um, our molecules are moving around, but they're touching each other all the time. Um, you may have heard of something called a mosh pit. Okay, I, yeah, I heard somebody laughing over there. Okay, well, it's kind of like a mosh pit. Okay, people are constantly moving around each other, but they're shoulder to shoulder. Um, or in a big crowd somewhere. Okay, um, I used to live in a town called Savannah, Savannah, Georgia. And uh, they had a big St. Patrick's Day celebration. And down River Street, it was like one huge, giant mosh pit. I mean, there were so many people down there. Everybody was shoulder to shoulder, but everybody was moving around each other because they were trying to get from this place to that place. There was this weird sort of flow of people in there. But if you get up into one of the little buildings there on um, Bay Street, on River Street, sort of overlook the crowd, you can see that everybody's they're moving around but they're pretty much always touching. Okay, so this is what liquids are kind of like. Now, gas particles, on the other hand, these particles are, are not touching for the most part. They're net, they, they might bang into each other and bounce off, but they're way far apart, okay? The difference in volume, if you have the same number of structural particles, atoms, ions, and molecules, structural particles for a solid, and the same number of structural particles for a liquid of the same substance, um, the volume doesn't differ very much at all. You may think that liquids take up more space, they have more volume than a solid does, but it's very slight, if anything. In fact, water, one of the mo most ubiquitous common substances on the earth, water is actually has more volume as a solid than it does as a liquid because of these interparticle attractions we're going to talk about. Okay? Now most things do slightly expand as a liquid, but not all of them do. So on average, the liquids don't have a great deal more volume at all than a solid does. But gas and then have, have a lot more volume. Okay? Um, I mean we multiply it who knows how many times. I don't know. Never seen a number for it. A lot more space in a gas. And well, um, I plan to bring in some liquid nitrogen so you can see the difference in volume pretty readily between a liquid and a solid and demonstrate some of that next week. All right. Think of structural particles like students and desks. This is what I mentioned a while ago. Wiggle around, but they don't um, move relative to each other. Liquid structural particles are like students in a mosh pit, touching, moving around all the time. And gases, these are really far apart. Okay, so if we were to take everybody in this room and suddenly run in all directions, of course you can't. You run in the walls, but that's what gas particles do. They run in the walls of their container, and um, but they're really, really far apart. All right, what I want to look at is how these behaviors of structural particles. Now, we're not talking about the substance itself. These are the structural particles within the substance. So, knock on the desktop. Okay, that's a solid, right? We're talking about the particles that are structured in that desktop, how they form that solid structure, okay? You have saliva in your mouth. That's the liquid, right? We're talking about the structure of those particles of liquid in your mouth and the structure of the particles, wave your hand around in the air, all right, those are, you can, if, if, when you wave your hand around, you can kind of feel the air resistance, okay? There is structure, we don't think about it very much because it's comparatively very um, unstructured by comparison to solids and liquids, but there is structure of the particles in the air. Those particles do interact. Well, what causes these structural particles 
to be a gas or a liquid or a solid, okay? They have behaviors, and there are more behaviors than we're gonna list here. We're gonna list and show how these three major structural behaviors, interparticle attractions, result in having a solid or a liquid or a gas, okay? And so we've got what you guys probably know as a Venn diagram. Factors that affect the state of matter of a substance. Well, the first factor I'm going to talk about is the strength of attraction between particles. Some attractions between these structural particles are very strong. If I have two ionic particles, and in the last unit we did a lot of stoichiometry where we're looking at how we uh, broke up one ionic um, structure particle into and, and, and dissolve it into a liquid and then might form a solid or a liquid on the on the right hand side of the equation. Um, that has to the reason that can happen is because of the inner particle attraction, how strong they are. Well ionic attractions are pretty strong. Okay? Of all the structural particle attractions, ionic attractions are the strongest. They're strong because of the particles having completely opposite charges. So if I have sodium chloride, regular table salt, sodium has a one plus charge. Chlorine or chloride, because it's a negative monoatomic ion, we call it chloride. Chloride has a one negative charge. And so there's a, you can actually calculate, we're not going to do it in this class, you can actually calculate the strength of attraction between those particles. Calcium a calcium ion has a 2 plus charge. Um, oxygen has a 2 negative charge. So the strength of attraction between a calcium and an oxygen is greater than the strength of attraction between a sodium and a chloride because of the strength of that charge, the amount of charge involved. The amount of charge uh, directly affects how strong the attraction is. Um, Polar molecules have an attraction both to themselves and to ionic particles because in a polar molecule, you've got one side of the molecule, this separate, discrete, uh, individual unit of a polar molecule, one side of it's going to be positive, one side of it's going to be negative. And so water molecules, which are polar, um, can pull apart an ionic compound. Not because the strength of attraction between the polar molecule is greater to that ionic particle but because there are a lot of them. So to get that sodium ion to let go of a salt crystal, I have to get a lot of water molecules around that sodium ion. And so the combination of all those water molecules pulls that sodium ion out. And then conversely also can pull out the chloride ion. Um, water has a positive end and a negative end. The positive end of the water molecule is attracted to the negative chloride ion, the negative end of the water molecule is attracted to the positive um, sodium ion. And you can think about it like this. Um, when I was your age, uh, we used to think it was a lot of fun to go out and um, pick up somebody's car and move it into a corner where you can't get it out. We just thought it was, I don't know, it was a big thing. Of course, we never left it there. We always waited the person came out, had a big hee-haw, and then moved the car out. Okay. And so we take their car and we pick up, it said to be parked in a kind of a corner, and we pick up the back end and move it over a little bit, and the front end move it over a little bit. Pretty much we had the front uh, right uh, rear bumper and the front left rear bumper into a corner there that were, where you couldn't move forward or backward, okay? Um, I wouldn't recommend you do that, guys, just saying, all right? The point is that I couldn't do that by myself, okay? I do not have the strength to pick up that car. All right? Just like water molecules by themselves, one of them doesn't have the strength, if you will, to, of uh, attraction to pull a sodium ion out. But you get a lot of them that can do that. Okay? And so we get a whole, you know, a dozen of us out there. And we didn't pick up the whole car. We pick up either the back end or the front end. Now we wouldn't actually pick it up. We actually kind of, almost kind of bounced it a little bit. But, all right. So, I know that's... You can't imagine Mr. Tedder doing crazy stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. But we were nice about it because we didn't leave it there. Just say it, all right? We never <laughs> damaged anybody's car, and we were careful not to uh, leave them, you know, stuck, all right? We weren't mean about it. 
and it only took a few minutes to get them unstuck or whatever. And we didn't do it to people that wouldn't also, you know, get the joke. Mm -hmm. All right, if, if somebody, you know, is kind of uh, uh, pretty, they, they hate, they, they don't like you to do mess with them like that, then we wouldn't do that to them. All right, this is only people that we were friends with. All right. So the strength of attraction between particles can affect something being a solid, liquid, or gas. Okay. The strength of attraction between water molecules, for example, uh, is pretty strong for molecules, but water in this temperature and pressure in our room is, is for the most part a liquid. Okay. Not strong enough to make it be a solid until we slow them down. Okay. Slow down enough, then there's enough strength of attraction between the water molecules to become a solid, and you slow them down by reducing the temperature, okay? And that's what lowering the temperature is. It's reducing the movement of the structural particles. All right, so um, another thing that also affects the state of matter, in addition to the strength of, of attraction, is the size and shape of particles. In our previous couple of units we talked about organic molecules and we said we gave a kind of a round idea number for what's a solid organic uh, hydrocarbon and what will be a liquid and a gas hydrocarbon. We said that hydrocarbons up to five carbons in length uh, we were, we're going to call a gas and for the most part they are. Okay. We said if they're between are they including and up to and including 15 carbons in the chain we're going to say that's a liquid. And after 15, 16 and above, we would call that a solid. Well, that goes directly to size of these particles. Okay? These individual molecules of methane, ethane, propane, butane, and all those, those sizes affect whether they're going to be a solid, liquid, or gas. And that has to do with the way that these structures can interact with each other. Okay? Also, the shape affects that. And we'll look at the structures in a minute or maybe later in the unit uh, and see how that works. It has to do with how the electrons move around. Again, uh, we talked about ions and polar molecules having a strength of attraction by those opposite charges. Even molecules that don't have what we call a polar structure have an attraction because of opposite charges. It's all about the charges. Okay. And then the last thing that's going to affect whether something is solid is a solid, liquid, or fast, and how fast the particles are moving. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about water heated up enough and move the particles around fast enough, and they start to fly apart and become a gas. They become steam. Um, cool them down. They sort of link together, but they're moving around each other like a liquid. Cool them down enough. They link together in a way that is uh, where they're stuck in place around each other. They don't move around each other. And you got a solid. So last night, we're in springtime when I'm recording this, uh, we had freezing weather. So there was some frost uh, out there. If, you, if There was enough moisture for you to see any frost. But um, so the water molecules had, had been um, slowed down enough that when they had something to link to, they would become a solid. Okay? But most of there's water in the air right now. There's a certain amount of water, even though within the range where most water tends to be a liquid, some water molecules within that liquid are moving fast enough to escape and become uh, in what you might think of as a gas phase. It's actually a vapor phase. We call it a vapor when the temperature is, is within that liquid range, but it's still a gas. Okay? So things vaporize when the temperature uh, normally would make it a liquid but there are some of these particles that are in the gaseous state or really what we would call a vapor state. So there's a difference between a gas and a vapor, okay? A gas is a gas because the temperature is in the gas range, all right? Actually, it's temperature and pressure in the gas range. Uh, it's vapor when it's separate, spread apart particles in what looks like a gas, but it's in the temperature range normally of a liquid. Got all that? So, we're going to spend a lot of time in this unit talking about um, gas laws. So, we're going to assume, for the gas laws anyway, that none of these 
structural particle attraction, even matter. Okay? For our gas laws, we have something we call the kinetic molecular theory. And the kinetic molecular theory assumes none of these attractions between particles affect the gas behavior at all. Okay? Now, that's not true. I want you to know right up front, the kinetic molecular theory, if it's, and it is, it's stating that, or it's looking at the way that gases behave, uh, assuming none of these attractions occur, the attractions are always there. Okay? If it weren't for those attractions between gas molecules, airplanes wouldn't fly, for example. Okay? Uh, so we need those attractions. They're, they're important to us. Um, ships, or sailing ships, couldn't sail. All right, a lot of things that are very important to us, but they're so minor compared to some of these other behaviors between structural particles and a gas that we can ignore them. Now, you've heard me use the phrase in here, a journey begins with a single step, right? Mm -hmm. I need to find out who, who, who I'm quoting there because they deserve the credit for that because I don't want to be a, uh, it, you know, um, quoting somebody without giving them credit. And maybe it's unknown, I don't know, but anyway. Um, so, but that single step doesn't get you very far, all right? It, we, we, Greenville is a city uh, that's, what, 30 miles away, all right? But if I take one step toward Greenville, how much did, difference did it make? Uh, that was a single step, but it didn't make much difference, did it? Okay? Well, we're kind of talking about the same idea between structural particles of a gas, their attractions that we've outlined here in this Venn diagram, and how much it affects the behavior of a gas. Not much, okay? Now, when you have a lot of these things, just like we said, water molecules can pull apart an ionic substance because there's a lot of them, all right? A lot of them, and a lot of those combined behaviors of all those molecules can make a difference, but for just the gas laws, they don't make a lot of difference. So unless we have really low temperatures or really high pressures, we can ignore for our study of our gas laws those interparticle attractions, okay? The critical thing is you understand that the temperature has to be other than very, very low and the pressure has to be other than very, very high. They can't be really low temperatures and really high pressures because then the size and shape of particles start to matter. The interparticle attractions start to matter. The strength of attraction between gas molecules start to matter, and our gas laws that we're going to study, the simplified, super simple gas, gas laws we're going to study, don't really matter anymore. Everybody good? Okay. So that's setting the stage for, that's the theory part of things where we start looking at how we're going to solve gas law problems. All right, let's look at Charles' law. Charles' law describes how gases tend to expand when heated. And um, Joseph Louis Gay Lussac in 1802 um, is sometimes credited with this law, but he actually, in some unpublished work, or he actually credited in some published work to some work that was done by Charles. Now, the history of science is speckled with people who are pretty um, uh, good at getting credit, and some were not so good at getting credit to other people. Well, um, Gay Lussac has a law of name for him, which, by the way, we won't be studying in our in our chemistry study here. I'll mention it. And I'll tell you what it is, but you won't have to solve any problems with Gay Lussac's law. But you will need John Charles or Charles' law. Okay. And uh, a modern statement of the law is: when pressure on a sample of a dry gas is held constant. The Kelvin temperature and the volume will be directly related. What is Kelvin temperature? Kelvin, the Kelvin temperature scale is an absolute temperature scale. And what I mean by that is there are no negative Kelvin temperatures. The lowest possible temperature there is is zero Kelvin. Okay, the lowest possible temperature there is is zero Kelvin. Now, zero Kelvin is a lot like, I like to think about it like percent yield because we just got through studying stoichiometry and percent yield and so forth. 
and that you can't have 100% yield, right? Am we telling you that? Mm -hmm. It's not possible to have 100% yield. I don't, I mean, unless your math is wrong or, I mean, you've got a super duper process and basically it's only 100% because your measurements aren't that precise. You really can't get to 100% yield. Well, you also cannot get to zero Kelvin, all right? It's just not possible in our physical universe to get there. We try, keep trying to get there more and more, and there's a lot of interesting research going on and how close you can get to zero Kelvin and what happens when you get close to zero Kelvin, um, that matter itself sort of crunches down on itself. Really cool stuff, but we're not going to worry about that too much. Um, but the critical uh, statement of this law for us, actually the one on the left here at the bottom is important because that really is the big idea. That there is a direct relationship between volume and temperature. Okay? If I have a sample of gas and I don't change the vol if I don't change the number of molecules and I don't change the pressure, if I increase the volume, the temperature has to go up. If I increase the temperature, the volume has to go up. If I in decrease the temperature, the volume has to go down. We don't have any, I mean, it's, it's what happens, okay? Um, there, um, but it's critical that you also understand this only works as long as the number of molecules or particles, structural particles in the substance remain constant. We don't change the number of molecules of gas and we don't change the pressure because the pressure does some other things and that's where gay lussacs law comes in. But if that's true, that if volume changes, the temperature also has to change in the same direction, and that's called a direct relationship, okay? If the volume changes, the temperature has to change in the same direction. If the temperature changes, the volume has to change in the same direction. We call that a direct relationship. If that's true, then the initial volume and temperature, if put into a fraction, this is the... Um, statement of the uh, law on the right hand, lower right hand side, mathematical statement of it, then the beginning volume and ending, I'm sorry, the beginning volume and beginning temperature in a fraction will equal to equal the um, ending volume and temperature in a fraction. Okay? The ratio remains the same all the time. All right? Well, that means that we can do some math with it. Okay? Um, Let's, before we get into the math, let's just make sure we're clear about some things that you need to know about our gas laws. There are some symbols you're going to be using. Rather than write out the whole word volume, we'll use a capital V, not a lowercase v. Capital V. N is the symbol we're going to use for moles. Now, N in math means a whole number, right? Y'all know that already in your algebra studies? Okay, well, because uh, moles technically are uh, a counting number. Remember, it's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles in a mole of anything, so it's actually counting particles. I guess that's why we use the letter N. I don't know. I just know that we use the letter N. I'm kind of like making an assumption. We shouldn't be making assumptions. Capital T is the symbol we're going to use for temperature, not lowercase t. Capital T, capital P. So the symbol we're going to use for pressure. Capital R. I'm sorry, lowercase letter M, not a capital M, is the symbol we're going to use for mass. K is a lowercase K, is a symbol we use for certain kinds of constants. More or less, you might say it's a simple constant, straightforward simple constant. Some constants are more complex than that. They're actually a combination of constants uh, where we start giving it a, a capital letter K. But in the case of gas laws, the most important constant is the ideal constant. I'm sorry, ideal gas constant. And in some places in the world, it's called the perfect gas constant. In fact, probably more, more places in the world than the United States, it's called the perfect gas constant. And we use the symbol R for that. Don't ask me where they got the R from. Don't know. Okay? All right, so let's look at 
an example of a problem here, okay? We have a gas that has a volume of 12.25 liters and a temperature of 270 K. And the temperature is raised to 300 K, what will the volume be? So this is looking at Charles' law because, because we have an initial temperature, which we symbolize as V sub 1, an initial volume, which, I'm sorry, temperature would be T sub 1, an initial um, volume, which would be V sub 1, a final or changed temperature of 300.0 K, and we're going to look for a second volume, which we'll call V sub 2. Okay, so the second temperature is T sub 2, the second volume is V sub 2, okay? Now, to solve gas law problems, um, you may be able to solve these problems, the simple problems, without going through a very detailed process that I require. When we get to the complex problems, this um, detailed, required, organized way of solving problems uh, can sometimes uh, save your pro save save your grade, so to speak. Okay, so I have a very specific way that I want you to solve these problems every time. I want you to get used to solving problems in this manner because it's organized. And complex problems become easier to solve when your problem solution is organized. Okay, the more complex the problem, the more organized you need to be in solving it. So we're going to start with the simple stuff and show the organization so that we get the more complex stuff, the organization isn't so hard anymore, okay? So our organization will look like this. We'll first list the knowns and unknowns. It's not enough to read them in the problem. I want you to list them uh, with their variable symbols. So volume one, or the first volume, we labeled as V sub one. Okay, and then we'll list the amount. Then we're going to choose the correct equation that we need to solve it. We're going to have four basic equations and two additional equations that really are derivatives of uh, one of those equations. And like I said, we're not even going to be using Galois X law. Okay, so that's not even part of our four. Then after we choose the correct equation and we've got our list of knowns and unknowns, we're going to plug in the values. And then we're going to use the dimensional analysis process that we've been using since unit one in here, the very beginning of our semester, to isolate the unknown. And isolate means to get it along by itself. And then finally, we're going to solve the problem. Okay? So this is going to organize everything in a way that will make the more complex problems we will get to easier to solve. Everybody follow? All right, then. Let's show how this goes. Here's our list of knowns and unknowns. See how I did it? V sub 1 equals 12.25 liters. All right? Because that's the first volume we have in the beginning of our process. Not the beginning of the problem itself, the way it's worded on the paper. But in the beginning of the process, we're starting with a volume of 12.25 liters. Okay? So you've got to differentiate in your mind the way that the problem the paper is written out and what the beginning of the process is. Before any changes take place, the volume is 12.25 liters. That's what I want you to know. Before any changes take place, the temperature is 270.0 Kelvin. Now that's a capital K. The symbol for Kelvin temperature is capital K. Notice there's no degree symbol. Fahrenheit and Celsius have degree symbols. Kelvin does not. The second volume, the final volume in this process we're looking at, we don't know in the beginning. So I just put a question mark there because we don't know what it's going to be. And the final temperature, before I do anything with it, is 300K. All right? All right, so let's look at this and how we're going to solve it then. Well, I guess I better focus the camera, huh? That might help. All right. 
Now, this is going to be easy for you to choose the right equation because I've only given you one equation so far. Okay? Later in this unit, <coughs> excuse me, when we have those four primary equations and the two sort of sub equations, the ones that are derivatives of one of the four equations, uh, you're going to have to figure out which equation to choose. Well, writing out your list of knowns and unknowns is how you figure out which equation to choose. The only equation that has V1, T1, V2, and T2 is Charles' law. So you're going to write out the form of the equation, the form of the law that allows you to solve this problem. Okay? Then the next stage is to plug in the values we know. Well, we know V1. That's 12.25 liters. We know T1, 270.0 Kelvin. We don't know V2, so I'm just going to leave that as V2. And then we know T2 is 300 K. Now, I know that you learned in math classes about cross multiply and cross divide. I want you to forget you ever learned that. Because if you try to use it to solve some of these problems, it's going to trip you up. I've just seen it happen over and over again. Um, you might use it. The other thing that, I, that students do is they don't know when to use it. You, learn, you know there's something called cross multiply and divide, but you don't know when you can use it and when you can't use it. For that matter, even how to use it. I've seen so many mistakes with cross multiply and cross divide. Just forget you ever learned it because it's not going to help you much in this class. Okay? Everybody understand? Yes, sir. All right. So what we're going to do then is we're simply going to isolate the unknown in this fashion. In order to get rid of 300K on this side and get V2 isolated by itself, I can do that by multiplying this side of the equation by 300K. All right? Right? That would cancel out 300K. That's the dimensional analysis process we talked about. All this cancels by this, right? However, um, there's an old children's proverb, what's fair for the goose is fair for the gander. What you do to one side, you've got to do to the other side of the equation. Otherwise, it's not really still equal anymore. So if I multiply this side by 300K over 1, I've got to multiply this side by 300K over 1. All right? That keeps this equation equal. All right. K can cancel. There's our dimensional analysis again. Now, here's the neat thing. Here's what's elegant about this process, or one thing that's elegant about this process we call dimensional analysis. If we've done everything correctly, the unit of measure measurement we have here that's left should match the variable we're seeking. And it does. Liters is a measurement of volume, right? Is it not? Okay. And then you just plug it in your calculator. And you've learned to do that already, haven't you? And I get 13.611 uh, liters. Now, um, let's see. This is, you need, to, you need to be using your own standalone calculator, not your cell phone calculator, because you can't use your cell phone calculator on the test. So you want to practice with your standalone calculator, all right, to get these numbers so you get good at this. Um, it's just, you need to get used to this process, okay? And then if I've got four significant digits here and four significant digits here, and four significant digits here, how many significant digits do I need in my final answer? Four. One. So I'm going to underline this last digit. I'm going to leave ourselves with four significant digits. 13.61 liters equals V2. And just so your teacher, me, doesn't get confused about what your final answer is, I'm going to put a box around it. Everybody understand? All right, let's solve this problem. Or you solve this problem, okay? All right, 
How'd you do? Did you use your, you have a problem with the calculator? Yeah, I think that's. Okay, let's just remember the process, all right? Well, I went through this when we were doing stoichiometry. Uh, if you got all the setup right, you know, the final thing is to get it done in your calculator properly, okay? So you're going to multiply all the numbers across the top. So 350.0 times 29.7. You're going to hit enter. Then you're going to press your divide key. Put in 150.0. Hit enter or equals again at the end. And that should give you the correct answer. Okay? So if you're struggling with that, <laughs> that's kind of like the simple thing at the end. But you've got to get it right. All right? And you got to know your syntax for your calculator. Now, not so hard with this stuff because every calculator will do that process uh, if you follow that process. Now, if you have more than one thing on the bottom to divide, and we will have some more later in this unit where you have to divide more than one number on the bottom, then you have to hit equals between each division. Okay? So you, you put the first of the two numbers on the bottom in hit equals, and then divide and put in the second number on the bottom, and hit equals, okay? Uh, all calculators, as far as I know, I've never found one that doesn't, all calculators would do this process the same way, and it's very fast, it's probably the fastest way I've found to put things in the calculator. Now, you can multiply everything across the top, write down that answer. Multiply everything across the bottom, write down that answer. And then divide, but that just, that just takes more time. The way I'm describing is a little bit faster, and can get you through on the test a little faster, okay? There's enough complex stuff that we have to do. Let's make it as simple as we can when we can. All right, now, um, one of the problems about, it's not really a problem, but one of the things you need to know about Charles' Law is that you can't find this temperature here on the bottom when this equation is written like this. You cannot solve directly for temperature or any value on the bottom of a fraction. Okay, you've got to rearrange the equation so the unknown, the thing you're trying to find, is on the top of the fraction. Okay, now in this case, it's pretty easy. Remember, whatever you do to one side of the equation, you've also got to be able to do to the other side, right? You've got to do both sides, keep treat both sides equally, all right, or you won't get the correct answer. So the easy thing is here, flip both sides. If you have an unknown on the bottom, just flip both sides. You got it? Now whether you choose to flip it as we just flip and put T1 over V1, T2 over V2, or you wait till you plug in the values and then flip it doesn't matter to me. But you got to flip it. Okay? Now having said that then, let's look at this problem. Oh, if I can get there. There we go. Okay. Now, uh, oh, you know what, this is actually a different thing. Let me tell you this. You can't solve these problems with temperatures in degrees C. Degree C is not an absolute temperature, okay? The problem is that you that it just doesn't work out. You gotta have an absolute scale here. Just like you can't have a negative volume. There's no such thing as a volume that's negative. You can't have a negative uh, temperature to make these equations work out. So we need an absolute temperature scale. That's the Kelvin scale. So if you'll get out your test references, and let's take a look at something real quick. So if you'll look on this sheet, now in an honors class, you can't use this sheet on the test, okay? But for right now, um, if you forget and you're doing your homework or something, the conversion between degree C and Kelvin is right here, okay? If I have temperature in degree C, I'll get a Kelvin temperature if I will add 273.15 to it, okay? That's how you convert now. If I have the temperature in Kelvin, I need to get to Celsius, what do you do? Subtract, not hard, okay? But now you're gonna have to memorize before the test 273.15. Hopefully we're going to use it enough there won't be any flashcard needs or anything like that, okay? I don't think there's any necessary to build out, do a flashcard for one thing you got to remember here. Um, you do have to remember these gas laws. We'll get to that, okay? For right now, I want you to know how to solve the gas laws, all right? 
So we just got to remember 273.15. So in our problem then, let's go back to the display of the problem. Okay. We're going to have to convert 20 degrees C to Kelvin by adding 273.15. Remember how I taught you to add to keep up with your significant digits? Add it vertically so that if any, there are any empty slots on the right side, you can round off the resulting digit. Okay, so solve the problem then, and we'll come back and look at the results here in a minute. Okay, let's take a look at the answer that I got. How did you do? Beautifully. Beautifully, she says. Okay. All right. Just remember that we're adding the 20 degrees to 273.15. There is an empty slot over here on the upper right above the 5. And the notation that we use in this class, you don't have to, but you can't put a 0 there. I use an arrow. That's okay. But you can't put a 0 there because putting a 0 there would be lying about the precision of that 20 degrees. The 20 degrees is only measure on the, measured on a device that measures to the ones place and you, to which you estimate one additional digit if it was an analog device. If it was a digital device, it was showing that last zero in the ones place up here. And so you can't, you can't put a zero to the hundredths place because they'll be saying your device measured to the hundredths place if it's digital or estimated to the hundredths, to the hundredths place if it's analog. So we don't want to lie. Okay, that's just not allowed. This is a science class. Ethics are important. Well, ethics are important everywhere. I shouldn't just say it that way. That's not good. Any of us should be having a fit. You know, math teachers be having a fit. It's only, what are you saying? Ethics are only important in science class? No. I'm sorry, I said it poorly. Okay. No, I got here. I know. I knew right away because I've set up my list of knowns and unknowns that I'm looking for temperature. And since temperature is on the bottom in this equation, I knew right away I need to flip. It would have been just fine if you plugged in your numbers and realized that your unknown was at the bottom and then flip. That's fine. But somewhere along the way, you got to flip, and you got to flip both sides. Oh, sorry. And so you get this answer here. Oh, yeah, this is the setup for the answer. You get this answer, you round off to that answer. Because these numbers all have three significant digits, except for this one. These two here, these measured numbers here and here, have three significant digits. Our final answer needs to also have three significant digits. Let's do the same problem, but now, well, it's the same problem. You have to solve the problem again. Just convert to Celsius. So you've had some practice with it. You know how to convert to Celsius? Do that right quick. Alright, so 147. Minus 273.15, 126.15, okay, and then we want to round off the last two digits, and you should get 127, so you're right, and 126 degrees C, that's the final answer, okay, everybody got it? Hmm? Would it be a negative or? It is. Yeah, negative. Okay. Everybody good? Yes, sir. All right. Okay. All right. So earlier I told you about some of the um, things you need to know uh, um, for variables. We're going to introduce Boyle's Law here in a second. There are uh, four different units of pressure you need to know about, so let me go ahead and go through all the units of measurement we're probably going to need to know, just so you have a, a good idea of what's going on. ATM is the symbol we use for atmospheres, okay? And that's a lowercase a, T and M. If you use a capital A, capital T and M, that means an automatic teller machine. So make sure it's lowercase a, T, M, okay? Uh, MM means millimeters. HG is the symbol for mercury. So there are these devices that measure um, pressure that use mercury. 
And so going back to Torricelli, we, um, this is an Italian from hundreds of years ago now, when he started measuring pressure, yeah, he measured it in millimeters of mercury. It's how much the mercury moved, okay? Uh, or the measure of the mercury on the device, and, and then you looked at how much it moved. Now, TOR stands for, oh, that's TORCELLI. Well, that's the same thing, really. Millimeters of mercury is also TOR, okay? When those are interchangeable. So this is one case where you really don't have to show me the math for conversions between millimeters of mercury and for to and tor, you just have to write the statement on your work. Millimeters of mercury equals tor, and that's enough for me to see that you know how we get the answer. If you need to convert between millimeters of mercury and tor, it's direct. You just got to say that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you have to justify it on your paper, but you don't have to do the math to justify it between millimeters of mercury and tor. You can just write. Millimeters of mercury is also tor, and then write your answer, okay? Now, Pascal is another scientist who studied pressure. Um, usually, we use kilopascals, and that's KPA. Pascals is capital P, little a. Um, and sometimes we capitalize tor, capital T-O-R-R, because it's named for somebody. I'm not sure why typically you don't, or I see in the literature, the texts and such, that they don't do that, but I probably would prefer it to be capitalized, but since they often don't, let's, I won't worry about it. But Pascal should be a capital P, little a, because it's named for somebody. Kelvin is also named for somebody, so you're going to capitalize the K for Kelvin. Notice Kelvin doesn't have degrees symbols. I, sh I, I mentioned that earlier, but Celsius does. Um, Celsius basically means the same thing as centigrade. So sometimes you'll see the term um, 20 degrees centigrade. It means the same thing as 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, centigrade is an older term. Uh, we don't use it very much anymore, but it's out there, and I sometimes use it because I'm kind of old. No chuckles. Not even a chuckle for that. Come on. Okay. I uh, talked about the conversion between Kelvin and Celsius. You had 273.15 degree <laughs> temperatures in Celsius to get Kelvin, and you subtract it to go from Kelvin back to Celsius. Cubic centimeters. Um, the symbol for cubic, something being cubic, or is multiplied, or, or I'm sorry, an exponent three. It means you multiply it by, by itself twice. So you take a number, multiply by itself, and then multiply by itself again to get a cubic measurement. That is a volume measurement, height, width, depth, okay? But um, it is the same volume size. A cubic centimeter is the same volume size as a milliliter, okay? And we also sometimes symbolize that as simply cc. In the medical profession, they often use ccs. Whenever you hear in the, in the um, hospital or the doctor's office, they'll give you a couple of ccs or, or you know, something, or that uh, you were given uh, an, um, um, intravenous fluids and you, you took so many cc's of it that's what they're talking about it's a cubic mil centimeter which is also a milliliter you need to know that you need to know that a liter is a cubic decimeter we won't be using that conversion in here but you need to know that I told you that okay I've seen whole textbooks where the unit of measurement the liter isn't even used they use cubic decimeters and here's why Liters are not one of the SI units, the International System of Units, okay? Cubic decimeters is in the SI system of units. So sometimes people are really picky about using the SI system, okay? And you need to know there are a thousand milli anything in a base unit, so there are a thousand milliliters in a liter. Standard conditions. Standard temperature and pressure are very important in gas laws. Standard temperature is 273.15 K or zero degrees C, okay? Basically, that's a freezing temperature of water. What we call freezing, we usually mean water is freezing. So that's basically freezing for water. We often use it in common language. It's freezing today. We're talking about freezing water, okay? Not freezing mercury because that's a lot colder. Or freezing nitrogen, that's a lot colder, okay? Standard temperature, 
I'm sorry, standard pressure is one atmosphere. And since we're using all these other abbreviations for, um, wow, I got all kinds of static today. Uh, all these other abbreviations for um, different pressure units, one atmosphere is the standard pressure. Well, that's equal to 760 uh, millimeters of mercury and 760 uh, torr. It's uh, also equal to 101.325 kilopascals or 101,325 pascals. We don't use pascals very much. We use kilopascals a lot. Now, Boyle's Law. Boyle um, looked at the behavior between pressure and um, volume. So in Boyle's Law, he found that if you multiply pressure times volume for the same amount of gas, if I have a fixed amount of gas, I haven't changed the amount of gas, and I've changed the pressure I'm holding that gas under, the volume will respond in an inverse fashion. Okay? So if I put, some, put a gas under pressure, the volume is going to go down. If I release that or, or increase the volume, the pressure is going to go down. Okay? That's an inverse relationship. So when I multiply pressure times volume, that's what he found. He got a constant. He got the same number. So Robert Boyle lived in London. Um, when I was in London, uh, I could see his house on the outside, but they were doing some repair work, so I couldn't go inside. But he had a basement, and he had a little tile on top of his house. It was a three-story house. So basically, he had a five, five stories. And he took his little J-tube full of um, mercury and walked up and down those stairs and could see that the mercury went up and down just by going up and down the stairs. And he, through that, began to work with pressure and volume and found out there was a, a corresponding response. When he multiplied pressure times volume, he got the same number every time. Okay, for the amount of trapped gas he had in his J-tube. Well, that gives us a practical version where the initial pressure times volume is going to equal a final pressure times volume. Okay? And that's Boyle's Law. It's even simpler, really, than Charles' Law. Because you don't have to worry about temperatures on the bottom and things like that too much. All right? So let's solve this problem then. And we're going to use the same system now. Every time we solve problems in this class, we're going to use the same system where you're going to make a list of knowns and unknowns, choose the right equation, even though I'm telling you up front what equation it is. Later on, you have to figure out which equation to use. List your equation, plug in the values, uh, isolate the unknown, solve the problem. Okay. Let's see. So, <clears throat> here are the values in the problem. The beginning volume is 1.56 liters. The beginning pressure is one atmosphere. <coughs> we don't know the final volume, but we do know the, do know the final, final pressure. Three atmospheres. And if I look at these variables here, okay, I know that Boyle's Law is what fits those variables. Okay, I have knowns and unknowns listed in my list here that match this equation. So I'll list out P1V1 equals P2V2. Then I'm going to plug in the values that I have for these variables. So I've got 1.56 liters for volume 1. I've got 1 atmosphere of pressure 1. So let's see. 1.56 liters is volume 1. Pressure 1 is 1.00 atmospheres. And the other side of the equation, I've got V2 I don't know, but P2 I do know, 3.00 atmospheres times V2. Now, whether you use a time sign or the dot, I don't care, all right? Uh, there actually is a difference between the two, but you've got to be in like your third semester of calculus in college before you know what the difference is, even then if it makes sense, okay? Uh, so in this, at this level, at this point in time, really isn't a difference as far as how you use it here. Okay. To isolate this unknown, I need to divide both sides by three atmospheres. 
So I can either multiply and put 1 over 3, or I can just put the three atmospheres in the bottom here. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so if I do it to this side, what do I got to do this side? Same thing. All right. Now, using the dimensional analysis process we've been using since unit one, I can cancel out atmospheres. I can cancel out 3.00. On the left-hand side, I can also cancel out atmospheres. And in this class, it's required. Show me you know how to cancel things, okay? Because I'm from... Missouri. Yeah. I'm going to call the state of Missouri and ask them if they're going to pay me for saying that every time. Anyway, you know, in TV shows and movies, it's called product placement. M&Ms will pay the movie company to put their their product in the movie. Y'all remember E.T., the movie? Reese's Pieces. Huh? Reese's Pieces. Reese's Pieces. That's the first big product placement that I recall hearing about anyway. All right. I know that's nobody cares, but anyway. So if I do the math, it's this number times this number. Hit equals on your calculator. Then divide by this number, and it equals finally to get 0 0.520 liters equals V2. And I think your calculator is going to show you 0 0.52, right? All right, so you have to know you need three digits, okay? You have to know there's three digits in the final answer. You can't just write down what your calculator says and say, my calculator said this. You know what? Be smarter than your calculator. But I'm going to count off points. Make sure you show the correct number of significant digits. Remember, leading zeros. This zero right here is a leading zero. It's not significant. Okay? Any zeros to the left are not significant. To show three significant digits, I need digits to the right of a decimal place and a non-zero digit in this case. All right? Anybody have a question about any of that? And just to make sure that I'm looking at the right answer and I'm giving you points for your answer, put a box around the answer to make sure it's clear. Anybody have any questions about that? All right, then. Oh, I was bringing up the... Homework. Don't forget tomorrow we have a lab. Okay? Before you come to class tomorrow, your pre lab has to be done. You can't, if you come to class tomorrow without your pre lab having been done, you won't be doing the lab. You can't scribble it there and down the last second. All right? You need to be aware of the procedures before you come to the lab. Dress safely, properly. Key things to remember long pants. Closed toed shoes. That's to say shoe that doesn't mean tennis shoes. You can't have cloth on the top of your toes. You've got to have leather or vinyl. And those flats that don't cover the top of your foot completely, those aren't allowed in the lap. Make sure you're wearing um, clothes that'll protect the top of your foot. Um, jewelry needs to be removed from your hands and wrists. You can do that tomorrow though. Bring something to tie your hair back if your hair touches your shoulders. Okay? Everybody understand? Yes. All right.